this morning I'm going to uh, talk to you about the baptism in the Spirit. And some of you already are beginning to turn your minds and your hearts off because you're thinking, yeah, there goes Pastor. He's fulfilling his denominational duty to talk about the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And yes, our third name around here is Pentecostal. Lawson Heights Pentecostal Assembly. But I'm not here this morning to preach some denominational truth. I'm here to preach God's Word to you. I'm here to preach God's Word to you. And I pray that we will be open and receptive to what God would want to do in our hearts. Say, well, yeah, yeah but you're going to talk to us about tongues. Gift of tongues. So, relax. That's the last reference to tongues this morning. We'll probably get there in this series. The Lord has laid... Uh, something on my heart for this morning that I want all of us to hear clearly. And I want us to be very clear on the fact that this teaching is not a denominational one. I want you to hear God's word clearly. Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 11. John the Baptist says, As for me, I baptize with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not even fit to take his sandals off. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This, my friends, is what it says about Jesus. Jesus is going to baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 33. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me uh, to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is not a denominational doctrine. This is Jesus' mission. Jesus is the baptizer. Came to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. He's about to leave, ascend to the right hand of the Father, and he says, uh, I, I got a promise of the Father for you. We're calling this series the Father's Promise. He says, I got a promise for you from the Father, and you're to stay in the city until you're closed with power from on high. You ever read volume one of a book and then volume two? Anybody familiar with volume ones and volume twos? I think the Bible, the way we've arranged it, does a little bit of disservice to Scripture because between volume one and volume two, we put the Gospel of John. But the, the book of Acts is really volume 2 of Luke's writing and Acts chapter 1 picks up the story at the end of Luke chapter 24 and this is what we read in Acts chapter 1 John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now and what did that look like what's it going to look like verse number 8 you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. I, I just want to make this crystal clear to you. Biblical Christianity is not something that takes the Holy Spirit for granted. 
biblical Christianity is a Christianity that pursues the Holy Spirit, desires the Holy Spirit, wants to be immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, understands the importance of the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus did. So what in the world does that mean? Sometimes we get the best understanding of what things mean if we can take a word that's used in Scripture and uh, see how it was used in secular writing. The Candor, N-I-C-A-N-D-E-R, uh, was a physician and poet, Greek physician and poet, who wrote in about 200 B.C. And he was writing about uh, the art of making pickles. I want to tell you what he said. He said, you take the vegetable and you bapto it in boiling water. And after you have baptoed the vegetable in boiling water, you need to baptize Baptizo, baptizo it in vinegar. Baptism is the word baptizo. You need to baptizo the vegetable in vinegar. And bapto, you bapto it in boiling. That's a temporary thing. But you take that cucumber and you baptizo it, you baptize it in vinegar and it permanently changes that cucumber and it's no longer a cucumber, it's a pickle. Now I don't want a bunch of pickled Christians around here, but I want you to get the point. God wants you to be totally immersed, totally drenched, totally changed by the Spirit of God. Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Uh, all of us were shocked and hurt and prayerful when we heard the terrible story of the bombings in the Boston Marathon a week and a half ago or so. And a couple of days after the bombing, the whole city was put in lockdown and some of us say, yeah, no, the whole city was put in lockdown. I don't know a bridge in a major city that would ever look like that. There was no movement in Boston. The city was put in lockdown. Except, interestingly, I found out one place was allowed to stay open through the lockout. Dunkin' Donuts. Because the police had to be looking after themselves. Who says it's a stereotype? Dunkin' Donuts stayed open in Boston. So the policeman could get re-energized. Now here's my reason for bringing all of that up. If Dunkin' Donuts was in Greece, it would call, be called a baptizo donuts. They would be getting immersed, these donuts, in the coffee. They would be dunked in the coffee. God wants you dunked. God wants you drenched in the presence of the Spirit of God. place we live. It's not a place we visit. Not some event in our life that we record in our Christian diaries and move on from. It is the very air we breathe. We live and move in the Spirit of God. His presence 
immerses everything we do. We live baptizoed in the Spirit. His Spirit changes us makes us something, makes, changes us from something we used to be to new creatures in Christ. From vegetables to pickles. Oh, I gotta find a better analogy. Not sure I want you to be either vegetables or pickles. nineteen seventy five I went to church under Bay Ontario and I looked up like we did church differently back then. There was a choir at our church and I looked up and there was a new girl in the choir. She's preaching here next Sunday. And I thought, oh, she might be neat to get to know, and I introduced myself, and within about six weeks, I became immersed in Donna. I've been immersed in Donna for 37 years. <laughs> My life was completely changed. I don't, I don't visit Donna once in a while. Donna affects the decisions I make. Donna helps me decide where we're going holiday. Donna decides every night what I'm having for supper. I, I, she completely began to immerse me in her life in a much greater way, in a much greater context, in a much greater understanding. The Holy Spirit comes into our life as a partner and we get immersed in Him. He becomes the primary relationship of our life. We're led by Him. We're directed by Him. We're controlled by the Spirit of God. Let me read to you Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter is preaching. This is the first sermon preached in the history of the church. And Peter's at the end. Peter's at the conclusion. And Peter says, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the message of the early church. And I bring that verse out and I teach on it and I get questions like this. Well, Pastor, uh, what if, uh, what if uh, I repent and don't get baptized? Can I receive the Holy Spirit? Is it possible to repent and get baptized and not receive the Holy Spirit? Do I have to repent to receive the Holy Spirit? I get all kinds of questions. I have a question for you this morning. Why do you ask those questions? Why do you ask those questions? Seems to me in North America, in our desire to become theologically brilliant, we have become theologically dull. Our desire to be theologically sharp, we have become theologically dim-witted. The early church only asked one question. 
When they heard Peter's message, the only question they asked was, What would you have me to do, Lord? And this is the answer. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Church, we need to wake up. We need to set aside this weak, namby-pamby-pamby religion that we have bought into, and we need to become not hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. And God and the response of a true follower of Jesus Christ, when he hears what God wants to do in his life, is you repent and you get baptized and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I uh, made the personal decision. This is not a pastoral decision. This was a personal decision because of what I sensed the Lord doing in my own heart, in my own life, as we've been looking at the Holy Spirit as a church. And where this is, I can tell this is going to last a little while. Not as long as Ephesians, but it's going to last a little while. That's an old joke for those who were here when I got here. I preached on Ephesians for two and a half years not going to last that, but we're going to be here for a little while because God wants to do a work in our hearts. So personally, I decided if I'm going to preach on this stuff, I need to refresh my heart and refresh my memory on what the early church looked like and worked like and felt like. And I was reading through Acts yesterday and I got to Acts chapter 5 and and uh, this is what comes up. <laughs> we, uh, the disciples had been in jail. They'd been miraculously set free. The, the leaders of the day didn't like it that they'd been miraculously set free. Pretty hard to fight miracles, though. I said, we gave you guys strict orders not to conti continue teaching in this name, and yet you've filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter and the apostles answered, we're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey, who obey. We're not meant, friends, to cut Scripture up into tiny little pieces that we think make it digestible. We are meant to be people who obey the Word of God. I don't like what North America has done to the gospel. We've made the gospel look like this. The preacher preaches a sermon. Then we invite people to raise their hands or come to the altar and pray a prayer and accept Jesus. I challenge you to find that pattern or that instruction in Scripture. We are not called to say little fancy prayers to appease ourselves if we're going to serve Christ. What we're called to do is repent. We are called to become wholehearted followers of Christ. We do what he says. We don't pursue our own plans and our own desires anymore. It is a complete 
change of priorities and directions and masters. People come up to me and they say, oh, blah, 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 how can we baptize him? He hasn't said the prayer yet. need to say a prayer, you need to repent. There are too many Christians in North America who are saying little prayers and then want Jesus to follow them around the rest of their life and they quote the lay, hey, hey, the Lord is with me always. Thank you, Jesus, you're coming around. We're hanging out. Jesus you're, is not meant to follow you. You are meant to follow him. Repent. to be baptized. <laughs> Since when has baptism become an option for Christians? You repent and you get baptizoed. <laughs> At the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to take the back of this card and indicate that you want to be a Christian. Our wording should be stronger on this card making a commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't dare tick off that line if you're not going to tick off, I'm going to be baptized this month on May 25th and 26th. Christians repent and then they get baptized. And if you're not willing to get baptized, you haven't really decided to repent yet. you glad I love being popular. We ask questions that are not meant to be asked. As followers of Jesus Christ, we do what Jesus tells us to do. And then you get filled with the Spirit. Perhaps the reason we don't talk about uh, being filled with the Spirit, point three, very much is we don't talk about repentance. And if we don't talk about repentance, we're not going to get to the third point. But you can't be filled with the Spirit is, until you repent, because until you repent, you're going to want to be filled with yourself. Good line. Don't know where that came from. Well, actually, I kind of do. You're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit till you repent, because until you repent, you're still going to be desired to be living a self-centered life. And those of us who are sincere followers of Christ need to put that nonsense behind us and say, I'm going to be a wholehearted, deeply committed pursuant of Jesus Christ. Heard a story yesterday of how a couple of hours being drenched in the presence of God changed a life. We need to pursue being drenched in the presence of God. Totally immersed in Him. And as long as you think you're the be-all and center and you need to have a final say in your life, you're never going to enter into everything God has for you. We need to repent, be baptized, and be filled with the Spirit. And what happens when you get filled with the Spirit? You receive power. <laughs> see, 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 here's the problem. Here's the problem.
the watered down faith that is prominent in the church world today goes something like this come on up say a prayer come on up say a prayer and after you say the prayer we say something like this we may not use these exact words but it's certainly implied congratulations now you won't go to hell if all Christianity is to you is fire insurance you don't need the Holy Spirit But if you want to have a life of power, if you want to be a difference maker, if you want to have victory and freedom and confidence in your spiritual life, you need the Spirit of God. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, that's what the Spirit does. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, discipline, power. Honeymoon prayer. God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power <laughs> through his spirit in the inner man the Holy Spirit is the empowerer of our lives can't live the Christian life in your own strength 1 Corinthians 2 verses 4 and 5 Paul says about his message and his preaching that it was not in, persuade, in demonstration of the persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. We need, friends, the baptizo of the Spirit of God in our lives. We don't need to be baptized. Little dunk once in a while in some hot water. Oh, that's a great service, Pastor. Really hot stuff today. We don't visit the presence of God. He is the very air we breathe. Yes, we get up in the morning and we say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. And we walk through our days immersed in His presence. God's plan. This is normal Christianity, friends. This is biblical Christianity. not some denominational thing. Normal Christianity is a Christianity where we are immersed, drenched in the Spirit of God. He affects everything we do. questions. I'm borrowing them from Francis Chan. It's an opportunity on your, uh, on your connection card to uh, get the church to order for you the book, Forgotten God. It's a great read. It'll do your soul good. It'll cost you 12 bucks, but it'll do your soul good. Four questions. Four questions. Do 
you believe God is great. I mean, do you really believe God is great? Like, not a little bit good, not a little bit great, but do you believe God is great? I'm excited to hear the yeses, but, 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 but do you believe he's this great? The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like the man who saw a field and said, I want that field so bad, I'm going to sell everything else to get that field. Is, is God that great to you? Do you believe God is great? coming a little quieter now. Do you believe God is great? Good. Do you believe God's way of living is best? to the point where your own agendas and your own desires and your plans and the, your own dreams about your future become irrelevant to you because you just want to do what he wants you to do. That's called repentance. Come on up here real quickly, Samuel. Come on. I want to introduce you to Samuel. Samuel is the son of a Pentecostal pastor in India. Stay here. Samuel is a graduate of Pindale, master's degree. Call a God in his life. This is really foreign to how we think in Canada. This guy is married. And his wife is in India, and she's not here yet. And his wife is... When are you having your first little one? Three months, something like that? Two months, four months? So due in August, so three months, yeah. So call it three months, anyhow. Let's take and do the math. And... Uh, He's here because he senses the call of God to reach the Indians of Saskatoon, the East Indians of Saskatoon, with the gospel. God's way is what matters. God's stuff is what matters afternoon, he and a small group he's already gathered are going to begin praying upstairs up off our multi-purpose room and seeking God's face for God to do a work. Got an example here of somebody who's figured it out. God's way of living his best. Bless you. Thank you. May be seated. Number three, do you in your heart want to be in love with God? I mean, love Him with all your heart. Immersed in a love relationship where everything else, everything else becomes secondary. Secondary. 
because you're letting him pickle ya. Change ya. You love him. You really want to love God. Number four. You want to have power in your life to live this Christian life. There's no other way to follow Jesus than in the power of the Spirit of God. And there's no other way to have the power of the Spirit of God in your life unless you're baptized in His presence, you're immersed in His presence, you're drenched in His presence, you're soaked in His presence. relationship with the Holy Spirit is not like some distant third cousin that you see every tenth year at a family reunion. You're immersed in your relationship with Him. Only way, only way, only way, only way. Did I say only way? A couple of times. It is the only way to have power in your Christian life. Let's stand and just drench ourselves of the Holy Spirit. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to drench you today. Immerse yourself in the presence of the Holy Spirit as we begin to conclude this service.